Her eyes reflected the fire and ruin of what she saw, and it was matched by a rage that was steadily growing higher and hotter with every passing moment. The Commissar had sent her tanks and most of her infantry forces to breach the perimeter through the gates, carrying strict orders to relieve any Imperial survivors along the way, collect them, and to rally at the Basilica for their final stand. But she herself, as well as her most vaunted forces, had chosen to go through a gap in the wall where the enemy were gathering, their attack craft circling high in the air, descending like white vultures. And now, as she stepped on and over the shattered flash crete and broken bodies of the crumbling wall, she could see exactly why, and it filled her blood with acid. The Jedi Witch Warriors and Lords were here en masse, collecting in the air aboard their hovering gunships, leaping down into one of the larger Imperial holdouts and savaging them with a frenzied insistence which all but openly proclaimed that they were set upon slaughter. She had little doubt that the heretical aliens and traitors to the human race were seeking to kill a particular target, perhaps members of the Basilica command staff, maybe even this Saint Lazarus she had been hearing about over her vox. The Jedi and their countless replicae slaves were frothing around the diminishing survivors with need she had rarely seen them maintain, especially after having escaped the massacre at the Spires. Without aid, they would all be cut down or worse, captured in only a matter of minutes. But that was why she was here, and she was not alone. Crunching steps sounded from all around her, Imperial soldiers following in her wake and emerging from the red dyed dust which coated everything like a thick penumbra. Traxians, tall and armored from head to toe, loomed in the shadows of the broken wall segments, overlooked by Cady and Kasserkin elites and Tempestus scions of the Calambian Thunderbirds. The grim Death Dealers led by their formidable commander, the Tempestor Prime known as Aloysius Cinder. And that was going without mentioning her own surviving squad of good lads, Runk, Marf, Trink, Trank, and Clubber. The big, childlike soldiers, Ogrins, one and all, were crowding around behind her protectively. And more than that, much more, was their own unofficial saint, whispering softly in her ear even then, a maddened stream of his constant, incomprehensible gibberish flowing into her brain, letting her know he was still with them. The Commissar who had become commander of these forces spoke no actual commands, she had no need to at this point. All that Commissar Jane Lee Ross needed to do was merely to raise her power fist and point one of her thick, sparking fingers forward. At that gesture, the Traxians stalked past her, each one of lanky limb and tall torso appearing almost as stretched as the Longshanks variety of mutant. Soon, their expressionless visors reflected only the glowing fire of their suddenly unleashed breaching guns. Long legs spread to brace the hefty laser-based weapons. The focused beams of those kinds of guns were somewhere between high-powered LAS guns and fully-fledged LAS cannons, each rotating nozzle spilling out a stream of molten light which carved into the backs of the copious replicate troopers. The energetic attacks sliced through their pale armors as easily as stale butter, and the men within were both burnt and liquefied even as they stood. Most did not even scream with their own mouths. Instead, superheated gases born of flash-cooked human meat and fluids squealed from the seals in their body gloves, taking the place of their death cries in high-pitched, inorganic whines. The Kasserkins had already taken up defensive positions from sheer habit, and they wasted no time opening fire on the Republic's slave army. They were wholly encased in their powerful ceramite armors, and were joined in their alcoves and firing positions by the Thunderbird Scions. Overcharged LAS beams co-mingled with tailored Orc Eater pattern bullets. The projectiles capable of blowing fist-sized holes through the skull of even a crested Tyranid warrior bioform. And after the first few volleys had gotten the Republic's attention, Jane nodded her head. Go get them, she ordered simply, and her Ogren warriors bellowed and charged past her, 
their bulk and speed billowing her long red cloak forward as they rushed into the crowd and began to turn replicae they found into puddles of human paste. It did not take long for the Jedi Witch Lords to notice them. Demonic powers propelling them across the field, many converging on their assault from multiple directions, reacting with abominable, if not admirable, speed to the death falling upon their slaves. The army of witches was too numerous to overcome, even for the force that she had brought, and Leros knew already that her surprise assault was doomed to a brutal staunching and ultimate failure. Or it would have been. But their saint was with them. She rushed forward to be among her men and brought the saint with her, sliding in beside Marf as a Jedi warrior leapt down in front of him. A double-bladed power sword of some kind spinning around the alien witch's robed body. She intercepted it before it could swing the thing into Marf, who was busy stomping on a pair of retreating Republic clones, crushing their guts out of their stomachs and into their mouths and helmets. However, as Leros faced down the Jedi who quickly approached, she did not raise her power fist to strike at it. Instead, she raised her other arm, and held aloft in her hand was the Psyker Saint himself. He was no more than a skull now, his flesh having melted away like butter under the heat of a torch, exposing bones shot through with crystalline veins which shimmered softly in the red light. Those lines of mineral power led up to a spot on the skull's forehead where a gem-like polish had formed around where the Psyker's metaphorical third eye would have been. She held it up, and the Jedi looked into it, the Commissar grinning viciously as the Saint attacked once more. As before, when they had escaped the rain of sabers and witches that had greeted them after surviving the falling towers within the Azure Spires, the offending Jedi was stopped in his tracks, eyes widening as they met the skull, and then bleeding suddenly. The stunned Jedi dropped its power sword, the weapon clattering to the ground where it deactivated against the scorched steel, its master beginning to scream. It cupped its head as if trying to hold its own brain together. But that did not last long, Leros reeling back her fist and pulverizing the robed Psyker with a single powerful punch. She raised the skull high and cried out the words that had carried them through an ocean of such beings already, bellowing their new war cry and hearing it echoed from the soldiers around and behind her. For Saint Gexian! For Throne and Emperor! The sudden cry caught Obi-Wan's attention as he backed off from his last offensive, panting and sweating heavily, pain bleeding into his body, cruel courtesy of his newest injury. His head was swimming with so many sensations and agonies, half of which were born from the exhaustion which was permeating so much of his current state. He could barely perceive his own precognitive sense anymore, the silencing of his mind growing more and more difficult with every passing second. But he was still powerful enough to defeat the woman who stood before him, though he doubted he could do so quickly. The Imperial was strong, lethally determined, and undeniably skilled with a sword, even outside of her powered suit of exoskeletal armor. That said, even now, this woman could not defeat him, and she would not wear him down fast enough to make that kind of victory possible. Though, he had to admit that she was doing an admirable job of staving off his blue blade. The Jedi Master had scorched her shoulders, arms, and waist, striking with a ruthless intention born of necessity, her blocks arriving too late to prevent some contact with his plasmatic blade but always reaching his saber just in time to prevent him from severing her limbs or torso. She backed off somewhat as he gave her a reprieve, breathing heavily as well, her face slicked with sweat as she stared him down, one eye slightly more open than the other as she swam in the pain of the many burns he had dealt to her. But the Imperial Sister was somehow still standing and ready to fight all the way to the end, though she did not charge him as he backed off this time, which gave Kenobi a moment to look around. Something was happening again, 
And soon, the Master saw that the war cry had heralded the arrival of yet another Imperial force. The very same force, Obi-Wan realized, which had been heading for the Basilica and cutting through their back lines before they had even engaged with the initial man who had begun this bloodbath. He understood now that they were out of time, and as if to emphasize the point, a cataclysmic explosion followed the realization. Obi-Wan felt it in the force before he heard it, head swiveling only to find that it had come not from behind or before him, but above his head. He craned his neck and saw that one of the hovering Star Destroyers high in the red and black sky had just been hit by something. The sudden flash causing Kenobi to shield his eyes from the brilliance of that detonation. Far above the fighting field, an enormously massive ship with a hammerhead prow was in the process of colliding head first with one of the Republic warships. The sun, which hung in the tarnished sky, previously red and malevolent by virtue of flame and smoke, was utterly blocked out by the new arrival's bulk, the star's ambient glow replaced by the shining death of the looming Imperial capital ship. The shockwave from the blast hit the ground a moment later, flattening clones and guardsmen alike under an invisible press of concussive force. Debris of enormous size began to rain down, Though, thanks to the forward push of the hammerhead dreadnought above, most of it landed in the city around the basilica and not the temple itself. And the ship was not alone, a fact that was proven before the eyes of all as a second, smaller hammerhead vessel crushed a second Star Destroyer in the same way as the first, this new ship still much larger than the Republic's own. These new Imperial starships did not stop their actions there. Ports opening along their hulls and spitting out a cascading, smoking rain, bombarding the roofs and spires around the Basilica with thickly built rounds of some kind of projectile weapon. However, these armaments were clearly of a strange nature, something he deduced thanks to the fact that the huge, teardrop bullets did not seem to explode or overtly damage the buildings they were fired into. Though Kenobi could feel some of the distant thumps of their collisions through the ground, their devastation was almost not apparent. Watching those odd new weapons descending brought his eyes down with them, where they caught something that made them widen. Though most fighters on the field had been pushed down by the now multiple shockwaves that came from above them, there were notable exceptions, and none more so than the three fighters he spotted in that moment. Obi-Wan watched in near open awe, feeling shocks of fear course down his spine as Mace Windu, the female assassin, and the Imperial agent fought like demons amidst the billowing hell that was sweeping away the dust and smoke. The Jedi Master was moving faster than Obi-Wan had ever seen before, a blur among the other two rapidly moving figures who leapt and slid around him like two wolves attempting to drag down a frenzied lion. Though Windu was performing to an extent that Obi-Wan had not even seen when they were battling Safran, he was clearly injured, outnumbered, and one mistake, just one, would be all that it would take for him to lose everything. Kenobi turned his eyes back to the battle sister he had been contending with, the woman having been pressed down to one knee, but still holding her sword up, glaring defiantly, still prepared to fight to the death and even beyond. The Jedi Master clenched his teeth behind his lips, making a sour expression before he lowered his shimmering weapon. It's time for me to leave, he said reluctantly to the obvious confusion of the woman he was battling. You... You are retreating? She gasped, disbelief evident in her voice. Kenobi shook his head and sent a wan grin her way. Maybe. I suppose you could say that. I prefer to say I'm tactically withdrawing. He corrected, turning away from her and facing the two-on-one duel he would soon be intervening in. You... You are a coward! You are running away! She spat, face still colored with shock and disbelief. Obi-Wan only shrugged as he turned his back to her. You may be right, from a certain point of view, but this isn't over. Consider your life and the lives of your men. The next time we meet, that consideration could be all that stands between you all and the pointless death. He offered as he crouched, moments from dashing off, 
Do not turn your back to me, Jedi. I can still... The woman began to rail. Then come, follow after me, Obi-Wan challenged, not even looking over his shoulder. But if you come for me, you'll have to leave him to do so. The Jedi reminded her, and she glanced back over her shoulder, seeing St. Lazarus was still there, watching on, all but helpless. The sister of the Emperor's faith bared her teeth, feet sliding further apart, raising her sword, but not approaching the Jedi, who was not even looking in her direction any longer. Though it galled her, she did not move away, and after a brief second, the Jedi nodded. This duel is yours. He stated, not waiting for another response, taking off like a loosed arrow and dashing straight towards the ongoing melee the other master was engaged in. This battle was over, and Obi-Wan knew the only way to preserve their greater victory was to withdraw and regroup. But, as he neared the frenzied fighting his colleague was involved in, the Jedi began to doubt that Mace would see it that way. This entire assault had been ill-conceived from the start, a meat grinder that Master Windu had insisted they cram themselves into simply to catch up to the man who he was now contending with. And worse yet, it was clear as day to Obi-Wan Kenobi that this was in no way worth it. More than any other part of the ongoing war across the planet, this charge at the Basilica Siege had been the costliest when it came to lives spent and ground gained. Tens of Jedi dead, hundreds wounded, thousands of clones destroyed, and tens of thousands of civilians eradicated. They did not need to be rushing. The enemy was cornered, and now that the assailing column had joined the Basilica forces, the entire Imperial presence on Axum could be finally hemmed in and contained. But they gained nothing by pressing their faces against the searing hot rage of these cornered imps. Now, all Master Kenobi needed to do was pull Mace out of this portion of the fight, escape without being chopped to pieces, and convince him that a total withdrawal from the temple grounds was the right option. Clutching his side, feeling as more blood left him and pain flooded in to take its place, as well as remembering Windu's countenance, Obi-Wan instantly got the feeling that this was all easier said than done. But even with his dulled senses, Master Kenobi could feel that something was coming. Something very big. Something very bad. Something that was making the Imperials all around him, even those who were wounded and cornered, cheer and bellow in a renewed hope. These soldiers then redoubled their efforts to resist, like exhausted men running a race, finding new strength as the finish line came into view. Whatever these new warships meant, Whatever these new munitions they were firing were, it was almost certainly something Obi-Wan did not want to find out about. His hairs stood on end, the Force gently screaming warnings into the back of his mind. Time was more than running out. It was gone. Heralds no longer sang in his thoughts. Rather, harbingers now arrived, dark in his precognitive considerations, like blots of blood appearing in the corners of his brain. He felt all of this, the growing dread of something he could not understand, save to know one thing. Death was descending, spreading its wings from the heavens, and he would not allow the Jedi to be helpless before it. Obi-Wan picked up his pace and ran faster. Mace was fire itself, and he reveled in it. The world screamed his name, boomed it across the sky, whispered it in every breath and heartbeat. Death! He had become death! He had brought death with him, and now he could feel it descending. Windu was the greatest battle master the Jedi Order had ever known, and now that was plain to see before the eyes of all. The Jedi and the Republic would triumph today, and it would be because he was not found wanting, because he was meant to be the blade which cleaved the foes of civilization. He was the cleansing tide, the Force's wrath upon this world. No longer would he tolerate the Imperials he faced. Now had come the time to extinguish the rabid, the evil, and the savage. 
and around him were naught but savages. Though he had only one arm to work with, his blade now moved at least thrice as quickly, speeding fast enough at times to occupy the space of ten sabers. Skipping and leaping back and forth between his two combatants, Windu danced! Natural talent and combat experience co-mingling into a display of push and pull he knew would win. The infuriating assassin that Obi-Wan had been meant to take down was the hardest of the two by far to keep pace with. Her movements and techniques like liquid steel, hardening to strike at him before melting to avoid his counter-strikes. But the fear she sought to inflict on him as she raged between his attacks, screaming and bending in unnatural ways, was utterly for naught. Mace Windu could not fear her, or anything anymore. He could see the reason why in the eyes of the Imperials who tried to keep pace with the battle. He could hear it thrummed and spoken in the silent voice of the Force. Windu could not fear her, could not fear anything, for he was fear incarnate, and he would now inflict himself onto the empire that challenged his republic. The agent, Samael, was less impressive, the imp being worn down and relying on the other warrior to create openings and keep the flow of the battle consistent. The Jedi Master resolved to kill him first, but it was only by frantically fighting between them that he could reach that goal and tire him out to the point of a lapse, a mistake which would end his life. It was only a matter of time, and he knew this to be true. He could feel it! That feeling of certainty, of death's inevitable close, drowned out everything else that might distract him. And Master Mace Windu could barely feel the nicks, cuts, and bruises he had earned since renewing his vigor with the power of the Force. Drawing strength from each insignificant pain, each heated lick of the skull-faced woman's knives, each brutish punch and push from the man she was evidently protecting. They thought they were winning, but Windu knew better now. He knew he had discovered the power behind this struggle, and that pain they now inflicted on him would be their undoing. Damn it, Heck! Keep pace! Uh, how have you not killed this bastard yet? Samael barked, reeling as his latest saber strike was driven off and away with a powerful counterblow, wind rushing off the attack. He's cheating! He's a witch! Was her simplistic reply as she spun into the air, throwing a dagger to force Mace's saber low to block it while she spun one of her heels down to clobber his forehead. It was a good move, and the only proper reaction was to dodge, but Mace wouldn't dodge her anymore. He would not evade, he would not run, he would only kill! And to accomplish this killing, all he needed to do was be faster! Something he did not request, but rather demanded from the Force. And so, eyes blazing like the pits of hell, he accelerated! The Jedi Master blocked the dagger with a purple blur, sweeping his luminous blade up, angling it into her leg, the strike becoming the essence of instantaneous. Hecate was caught off guard, eyes wide, unable to pull out of her attack as the Saber of Light rushed at near relativistic speeds to slice into and through her limb. The partially awakened Psyker fumbled for the power of the Force, but it was too late, far too late. What saved Hecate from a delimbing was not her own strength in the warp, but Samael's. The man having seen the movement for what it was, and extending his hand in a pumped fist, instinctively tossing her back with his own mind, throwing her end over end and away from Mace Windu's thirsting saber. It still burned her, scorching her only barely, but scouring skin along the back of her heel and calf with the plasmatic heat of his lightsaber. Hecate recovered, rolling and growling when she hit the ground and came to her feet, but stopping when she heard what came next. I'm taking center space. Observe Autoarch Delta, or Custodian Sigma, depending on how this plays out. Samael said, not speaking very loudly, but loudly enough for her and her foe to hear. No! 
She railed instantly, head snapping in his direction, eyes leaving Windu for the first time in several prolonged minutes. I can still... She began, but was halted before she could continue to protest. Hecate now! Samael bellowed, charging forward, and his assassin, ultimately loyal to her orders, fell back, their positions switching. Maze's mind was far from gone, and he considered the turn of events playing out before him. His breath steaming the air, his saber burning in his hand, hungry, instincts demanding the death of the enemy in their entirety. Before, the Imperial Man had let her go in, reducing himself to support, which made sense since she was the physical superior between them. That insane, savage woman was far faster and stronger than Samael by nearly every metric. And she had taken only scathing blows, if any thus far in the fight. But now they traded places. And Windu decided it would not matter. He would kill the man first, and then deal with his death-dealing bitch. As was his original design, a design made easier now that he was not hiding behind her. Mace threw himself into Samael, the man dueling with him briefly, black eyes glinting, locking onto Mace's own. But the Jedi's eyes were no longer dark, instead glowing bright with a vicious intention to rival that of the assassin. The imp could barely risk any strikes of his own, drawing Windu's attention while holding a tight defense against the lashing, spinning onslaught of Windu's flurrying strikes and lunges. But even as he laid into the man, the Jedi Master never lost track of the other combatant as she began to circle, waiting for her opening. He refused, however, to allow such an opening to exist. Uh, you know, there are a few interesting things about Space Marines. The man grunted, barely able to speak as their sabers clashed, chemical sweat spilling over his brow as he pushed himself just to keep up. Windu did not entertain his attempts at talking, responding with a hate-filled glare and clenched teeth. Speaking was over. It was done. Mace had absolutely no words left to waste on the pair of them, and Samael's banter went unheeded, save for a soft intensification of the already blistering speed of the battle. We can breathe in water. Samael continued regardless, still speaking as he was driven back and down, Mace Windu advancing on him all the while. It was not just his speed which had increased, it was his strength as well, and Windu hammered into Samael's defense. Spinning once, slam, then twice, slam! He was beating the Inquisitor's radiant white blade aside, the Imperial Warrior barely able to raise the energy sword in time to parry each following strike as he recoiled from each tremendous blow. We can eat the memories of our enemy! We can even survive! Dormant in the vacuum of space! The man groaned, knuckles white on the handle of his odd power sword, hand aching, almost breaking as it continued to absorb strikes that felt like the deflections of entire charging speeder vehicles. But you know, what I think the most I ever got out of being a space marine was? He asked, at last coming to the crux of his words, tossing them pointlessly at the feet of the frenzied Jedi who did not so much as slow for the sake of comprehension far past that point. Their blades locked, both men clenching their teeth, groaning at each other as they applied their full strength to one another, leveraging their blades. Samael clutched his in both hands fearing he would damage his own weapon as his death grip on it tightened, trying to push their conjoined swords of light up. Windu held his with one remaining hand, and yet he was even stronger than Samael in that moment. And as he glared a desire to kill the Imperial painfully into the Inquisitor's eyes, their stuck weapons began to be forced down. The man he faced puffing with exertion as he was slowly defeated in their contest opening his mouth to voice a prolonged grunt, bruises appearing under the sleeves of his clothes as muscle fibers snapped against the unnatural strength of the Jedi. Mace knew the man was done. He knew it, but then pain! 
Mace screamed in fury and agony, one of his eyes blinding immediately as the man in front of him spat right into his face. But the spit was not normal human saliva, as was evident the very moment it made contact with Windu's skin and eye. It was some kind of synthetic acid he had produced from his mouth. The chemical concoction eating away at Mace Windu's cornea and surrounding eye flesh immediately, scorching the skin around it and down on his cheek. But as Mace had already determined, pain was power, and he now had a lot of it. While he reeled in internal shock, while he bellowed in agony at the loss of his eye, his combat form did not falter. Only strengthening instead, only speeding up his movements, not stifling them. Mace Windu broke the lock in their sabers and spun like a top, ducking Samael's counter-strike and coming to face forward as he drove his saber straight. The humming, glowing tip aimed for one of Samael's hearts. It was over in an instant. The bar of glowing purple energy carving through Samael's chest and then into and through it, bursting from his back in a steaming ejection of boiled blood. Red ichor spilled over Samael's lips in an instant, thick and arterial, and in spite of the pain which still writhed within his face, Mace Windu broke both his stoic glare and his creased expression, a demonic grin hideously spreading over his features. He twisted the lightsaber blade within the man's chest, widening the circular hole even more, letting the Imperial feel every searing inch. Mace wanted him to suffer, to know the pain he had inflicted on others before being cast, screaming into the arms of the Force. Nothing, Mace growled, getting closer to the impaled man's face, pushing the very hilt of his saber into the hole in his chest. Nothing! Not your super soldiers, or your battleships, or your insane false god will save you from what you have done. The Jedi Master spat, kicking Samael's saber out of his hand as he twisted the hilt he had pushed into the opening of the wound, letting his textured lightsaber grind against the cleaved flesh of his enemy. Even more fresh blood spilled from Samael's mouth, crimson streams flowing past grimacing lips. Now die, you defeated savage, and tell your god I will send many more after you before I'm done! The Jedi Master proclaimed, concluding his words and rearing his booted foot up, kicking Samael in the chest with the intention of dislodging him from his saber. Without missing a beat, the Imperial Agent grasped Mace Windu's wrist and forearm with his own free hands, securing thick, gene-enhanced fingers around the Jedi's remaining fighting limb, so tightly that Mace's bones fractured in his grip, making him wince in new agony. His kick was force-empowered, sinking into Samael's ribs and fracturing the plates he felt under the Imperial's skin. But the Inquisitor did not release him, did not even allow the arm to budge a single inch. Mace stared into his opponent's face, the Jedi Master shocked by what was now occurring as the savage he had thought defeated held him tight. Like I was saying, we are really hard to kill. Samael managed to growl past the blood bubbling out of his mouth and throat. Blood which spattered Windu with small gouts of red, which hardened and became dry in seconds after falling onto him. And then, suddenly, the assassin girl was behind the man, running towards them both, and all too late, Windu came to understand the trap he had just fallen into. He jerked his arm, trying to yank it free, but even with the force, Samael held onto him, using his own metaphysical techniques to combat Mace's sudden attempts to thrust him back, or to grasp Hecate with an invisible grip. Takes more than losing a heart to kill something like me. 
The Imperial spat at the Jedi, his assassin jumping onto his shoulder and driving her bladed fist towards Windu's face, aiming for his blind and sight-filled eyes, both of which grew wide. He couldn't block, waver, or escape, trapped by his arm, even after releasing his lightsaber. In final dread, Windu realized that he had been too hasty, and now they had him. Or rather, they would have had him, but Obi-Wan Kenobi would not let it be so. Suddenly, Mace was the one who was pulled back. Samael pulled with him for a brief moment before he was dragged in the opposite direction. The two men flying apart as two simultaneous force pulls ripped them both from each other. Mace's arm flagged in the wind, broken in several places as he soared through the air, the Imperial across from him being thrown back, Saber still impaling him, the frontmost half of the emitter still jammed painfully into the impalement wound, which held it in place. Hecate shrieked in a frenzy as her blades did no more than cut the bridge of Windu's nose. The Jedi Master's sudden exodus pulling him from her reach, only to be caught from behind by a grunting Obi-Wan who cushioned the blow of Mace's impact against him. Windu blinked and then beamed brightly, pain almost forgotten in the sudden elation of life. Standing up as soon as he had his balance, he turned to grin at Obi-Wan, newly broken arm twitching, crooked, and then straightening brutally as Windu forced it back into place with the Force. And that's when he saw that not only was Obi-Wan standing there, but eight other Jedi as well, all holding their sabers aloft in fighting forms. His order had come for him. Well done, Master Kenobi, he congratulated. Now they cannot stop us. Now we finish, he began to say, straightening and clenching his broken arm, wreathing it in power, fully intending to use the shattered limb to finish what he had started. No, Master Windu, we cannot, Obi-Wan countered, the words draining the smile from Mace's face. What do you mean we cannot? We are the Jedi! They're mere... Mace began to argue before seeing that a gunship was landing behind them, and all the Jedi present were preparing to board it. Kenobi, what have you done? He demanded to know. I've called for a withdrawal! Obi-Wan explained, voice hard and unyielding. A what? You mean a retreat? You... You are ordering our forces to run away! You are giving our victory to the enemy! Mace accused, pointing a crooked, broken finger at the other master. If that is what you want to call it, then fine. But we need to get out of here. We need to regroup and formulate a better- Obi-Wan began to say as the gunship landed, cut off by a sudden furious tirade from his superior. What we need is to press on, Master Kenobi. The goal is in sight! Windu roared, gesturing towards where Samael kneeled, Hecate at his side, carefully deactivating the lightsaber which was impaling him, and drawing the handle agonizingly out of the Inquisitor's wound. You won. They are defeated. Unless you want this small victory to turn into ashes in the wind, we need to- Obi-Wan tried to say, but Mace, filled with rage and power, would not let him finish. You need to follow orders, Kenobi! My orders! I told you already, we are finishing this! The only ashes here will be theirs! We are so close now to- The vaunted Battlemaster of the Jedi Knights went on, suddenly cut off in turn by his colleague. You need to look around, Mace! We're going to lose if we do not approach this the right way! Too many Jedi lives! Too many clones! We must regroup! We should never have even come here like this. You yourself said so before that Imperial got into your head. Obi-Wan yelled into his face, but Mace was having none of it. He pushed past Obi-Wan, shoving him to the side and addressing the other Jedi and clones. Belay that withdrawal! We are continuing the assault! He barked at them, expecting them to fall in line. But most of the Jedi only stared at Windu in shock. His madness writ on their faces. Some of them nodded, nose flaring, eyes blazing, but
but most lowered their sabers, several continuing to hop into the gunship. Mace felt his face flush hot, and he turned to face the clones assembling nearby, preparing for their own gunship to retrieve them. You are not to leave this battlefield! I am giving you all a direct order! He boomed at them, and the clones straightened, some saluted, and yet once more, most did not hop to obey, instead looking towards the other Jedi as if seeking permission to concede to the Battlemaster's orders. This more than anything else, boiled the Jedi Master's blood. Even the clones had become cowards. They would never win their war this way. They needed to be stronger. There could be no retreat, no weakness. We are not pressing ourselves into this meat grinder. Mace, please listen to reason we... Obi-Wan began to say, only for Master Windu to spin around, his face a storm, his remaining fist whipping out, whirling with the force as it struck Kenobi across the cheek. The blonde Jedi Master was thrown off his feet, bones crunching, his body hitting the ground hard, and remaining still. Jedi Master Mace Windu glared down at the fallen, unmoving form of his friend, Panting hard, single fist clenched, teeth bared in a vicious expression. A moment later, Mace furiously spun around, observing the battle and ignoring the horrified looks given to him by the other Jedi. It was too late. Too many were already pulling off of the field even now. Like it or not, Windu was forced to concede that the decision had been made for him. Pick him up! Mace Windu growled through clenched teeth, keeping his back to the other members of his order, eyes seeking the Imperial agent and his assassin. But they were gone, vanished from where they had been, disappearing into the scattering smoke and ashen rain. It seemed he would be denied everything for now. We, we are regrouping. Move now! Windu managed to order, and at that, Clones and Jedi rushed forward to lift Obi-Wan's body off the ground. They carefully carried the limp Jedi back to the gunship as another landed beside it, the turrets on such small craft firing to provide cover for their organized retreat. Soon, Windu was on one such ship, a Bacta rebreather pressed firmly to his face and tied there by a strap, cradling his severed arm as he watched the ground draw away. The Imperials fired up at them with various guns and cheered even more loudly as the Republic began to withdraw back behind the ruined walls. Imperial gunships beginning to descend from the vast void craft above them after they had left the scene. The new bulky ships landed close to the Basilica and upon its immediate grounds, opening to release tanks and massive men in armors dyed the same color as his own now lost lightsaber. The Jedi Master's eyes burned yellow and red, fires of rage licking his heart still, turning his calm into an inferno, just waiting for its next chance to be unleashed. This is not over, you savages. We are not done yet. He growled into his back to mask. Already his free hand held a calm disc, Commander Neo appearing in miniature holographic form over its surface. The clone saluted. Master Windu, the second wave is ready, the man reported. Good. How many Jedi are with you? Mace asked through the plastic of his back to breather. Seventy Jedi, sir. Should we cover your retreat or... The commander began to ask, but was cut off. Increase that number to five hundred. And no, commander, you are not to cover our retreat. I want you and the second wave invading the walls as the last of us push back from them. I do not want you to let up on them. Give them as small a lapse as possible. Push them into the ground, Commander Neo. Deliver the final blow to this temple and take it in the name of the Republic. Understood? The Jedi Master ordered. Neo stomped within his stiff salute and nodded. Say yes, sir. He said and then faded from sight. Already, Windu could see the forces of the second wave encroaching onto the enemy's perimeter, recently deployed reinforcements of fighter tanks speeding over the distance, Jedi and clones alike hanging off their sides. 
Lat gunships both moved in with them carrying more troops and ATTE walkers, while some doubled back, swiftly moving to retrieve the Jedi Mace had just ordered to the field. He looked down at his crooked arm and clenched that fist again, feeling the agony bleat out of his nerves at that moment. Mace spat out blood that streamed into his mouth from the deep gouges across the rim of his nose. He knew he would not be able to rejoin the battle for at least some time, not wounded the way he was, and the fact made his animosity grow even deeper. But even if he could not be there to deliver the final blow himself, the forces of the Republic, HIS forces, would act as his hand, crushing the life from the final vestments of the Imperials at the Basilica regardless of what limited help they now received. I'm not done yet. He swore to them as he stepped back into the darkness of the Lat gunship, ignoring the clone medics who even then crowded around him, and the still unmoving shape of Obi-Wan Kenobi. Through all the pain inside you Down we 